Can you hear me? Yep. Uh, good evening, everyone there, and welcome to another edition of our Justice and Pieces guest speaker series. So today we have a real special guest, a special treat for you. Uh, I always tell you it's great to have you know, these uh, unique origin stories. And today we have someone who was an athlete and competed in multiple Olympics there and can tell you about that, that journey and then transitioning from there into practicing law, uh, doing civil litigation here. So Tuba, thank you so much for joining us here today. Perhaps, you know, I know I certainly didn't do any justice there, uh, but you can tell us a lot more about you know, your background, how you got into law, because I think it, uh, as I was telling you, it's probably one of the coolest, if not the coolest of the you know near 400 people we've had on. I think uh, my students can kind of agree here. Uh, it's definitely very unique. And, and thanks so much for joining us today. Well, thanks for having me, Paul. It's a pleasure. Um, it's is it Paul or do you prefer John Paul or JP is fine. You can go with JP. JP. Okay, so JP is uh, also very official sounding for law, so that's good, kind of good. Um, so yeah, then my name is Tuba, and I actually my origin story is a little bit different, just because I was a. There are a lot of athletes actually that I met in law school, but not too many multi Olympians. Um, you know, I had a, that, that was my dream for my entire life is that I wanted to be an Olympic figure skater and, um, pursued that so far that I came from my native country of Turkey to Canada at the age of 12 and a half to pursue that dream with my family. Um, so we made a ton of sacrifices. There was lots of ups and downs. Nothing was a linear straightforward route in that career, just like in law, I find. Um, but you know, made it to eight world championships, nine Europeans, uh, two Olympics along the way, um, experienced many things that were exciting, um, have lots of, lots of memories, but basically by the end of 2015, I had been coaching for about 15, 20 years, uh, figure skating. And I decided, um, I wanted to do something different. Um, I had taught like two generations of figure skaters. I had brought them up from sort of like nine years old to, um, sort of 16, 17, or even in their late twenties doing international competitions of their own and worlds of their own. So I was looking for something different and I thought, you know what, like from coming from Turkey, my parents struggle with employment law in Canada. My own struggles trying to make it to the Olympics when the judging system changed and figure skating in around 2001, I like had this thought that if you know the rules of the game, you're going to do a lot better. And I recall my parents, once they sort of had an idea of employment law, how their lives, quality of life improved quite a bit because of um, just because of that knowledge, they knew how to speak to their employers and what their rights were. So I thought I'm going to do, I'm going to do that. I'm going to go to law school and see how I can help people who maybe don't know the law and how I can lead them in a certain way that improves their quality of life. Because I felt I did that for skating for kids too, but I wanted to do it on a different venue. So that's when I went to law school. I got into University of Ottawa, um, lived in Ottawa for three years during law school, and then came back to my town of Barrie, um, Ontario. And so now I still live in Barrie and work in a small firm in Aurelia, which is 30 minutes north of here. And I do civil litigation, a little bit of family law, LTB, um, a little bit of POAs, POA courts, and um, yeah, whatever kind of walks in the door, we try to, we try to do our best. <laughs> So it's, it's great there. And I think certainly maybe uh, before we get kind of into the, the law side, I think, you know, there, there's obviously the interest there on you know, the figure skating career and, and competing in, in 2006 and 2010. So perhaps maybe you can talk a little bit about, uh, uh, and then I'll give you the challenge of kind of making a little bit of a parallel to, to practicing or, you know, or do you get more nervous before court or before a competition type of thing? But what would you say, you know, if there's one thing you can highlight here for, you know, the, those interested in the athletic accomplishments of yours, what, what stands out for you? You know, I see in the background, obviously, you know, holding the flag there as, as uh, um, probably maybe that's the answer. But what can you tell us a bit about, you know, your figure skating career that uh, you know, those uh, who are in, in school here studying law can relate to in some way? So my highlights sort of were times when I could connect with what I wanted to do, which was perform perfectly. It's very rare, um, but it's happened a few times. I was lucky enough to experience that feeling of that, you know, that zone that people talk about um, when your preparation and your opportunity meet and you just rise to that occasion and you're in that zone they talk about. Um, those are just times where I performed and I was not tired at the end. Um, and I remember one particular in 2006 after the Torino games in Italy, 
I had world championships three weeks later in Calgary, Canada. So that was significant for me because I lived in Canada and I was a Canadian citizen, but I represented Turkey. Uh, So it was almost like a home world championships for me. And the other part of that was it was after an Olympic year. So we were all dead, tired, all the skaters, all the athletes after Olympics, that's a huge high to come down. And then you've got to gear up in three weeks to compete at worlds. So that's a whole different mental challenge that we had to face. Um, but I competed my short program and my long program and they were almost flawless. Like my short program, I remember was perfect. Um, I didn't put a step wrong, which is unusual, you know, in competition, you always sort of do something that's not quite perfect. And then you have to sort of think, okay, go back to the plan, keep going as if nothing happened, which is similar to law, right? You're going to say something or they're going to ask you a question. A judge is going to direct a question towards you and you're going to maybe take a second extra to answer that, but you, you move on. Right. But that didn't happen in, in Calgary. It was perfect. And I remember as I was bowing, um, I saw my mom, she was clapping for me and I was like, this is the moment, you know, this is the one I'll remember. So that one, and then obviously carrying the flag in um, Torino was a dream come true. Um, It's every athlete's dream to represent their country at the Olympics, let alone get to lead their team into the stadium. So that was pretty cool um, for me. Um, What else? There's so many, it's hard to say. Um, Yeah, so Vancouver Games was also almost felt like uh, sort of a home Olympics for me. I had been in Canada for 20 years at that point, you know? So it was, well, 20 years, like 12 years, let's say. But, um, you know, it felt like it was home. I felt like half part of the Canadian team. I knew everybody. I trained together with all the Canadians, um, you know. So it was really nice to just have that, like, home Olympics experience as well as being able to represent Turkey, which is um, where I'm from. So those are three three highlights uh, of my skating career, I would say. And I see some, I guess one of the students here that seem sort of wavelength here as me. So maybe you can, can follow up with the similar question here about finding the commonalities between being a professional athlete and competing at the highest level there and you no know, practicing law. What uh, have you taken from that experience? And as well, you know, you've also spent time coaching, um, you know, the next generation or two, two generations there, as you said, uh, what can you kind of make that connection with, with your, your practice of law today? I think the world of sports has a lot to offer to the world. I think every kid can benefit from any type of sports that they can sort of even experience. Um, Taking it to a high level as I did, you know, that's, that's really great if you can do that, but if you don't, you still are going to learn dedication, Um, being able to show up on whatever time you're supposed to show up on um, consistency, stability in training, being able to leave whatever is going on in the world, in your world, in your personal world out there, So you can step onto that arena and perform or practice the way you're supposed to practice. And then not only is that great for that craft you're working to hone, but it's also good because it gives you a mental break from whatever is happening in your life that might be, you know, uh, stressful at the time. So I think that kind of thing um, translates to law quite well. The other thing is, as I mentioned before, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to be faced with things that you don't anticipate. It's what can you do? when you're faced with the unexpected, right? So sorry about this. There's a cat on me, but um, what can you do when you have something that you didn't anticipate that you didn't plan for, even though you plan for hours and hours of hours to have something go a certain way, can you recover from that? Because these things will occur, whether you're in sports, whether you're in the business world, whether you're in law, right? Um, What can you do to make sure that that step back and then continue forward with what you were planning on doing. So, you know, adjusting your goals, adjusting your vision um, to fit whatever world you're in right now, not maybe what you planned. Because in skating, in sport, you get injured. You, you know, things happen, your flight's delayed. You can't get to this country in time that you were supposed to get to, or your, you know, your elevator is stuck. That just happened at the Olympic Village because those places are brand new, right? They build those residences just for the Olympics. Yet a lot, you'd be surprised how many people have to call the fire people because they're stuck right before their event in in an elevator and they can't get to their shuttle bus to get them to their like event. It's pretty insane. And it's the most stressful thing, but you, you go with it. Right. So I find a lot of deadlines in law. Um, We have a lot of tight deadlines, but they're really not surprises. We do have some urgent matters that happen. So if you plan it out, right. 
just like in skating where we had, you know, you're eight weeks out from competition. You have to do this, this, and this. You're four weeks out. You're doing this, this, and this. That kind of thing. It really translate into, it translates into the practice of law as well as just life in general. So if anyone can be into sports or have their kids going to sports, I highly recommend um, that type of a life experience for, for children and growing up. And I'm sure we might get some more questions there about that uh, later, but uh, I did, did obviously want to go in and talk about your legal career uh, and starting with going, you know, you, you mentioned that the decision they're talking about, you know, learning employment law, you're, you know, for your parents there and how things change. And so you made that decision. You, you went into law school, you started in Ottawa. What was the experience like? And uh, I know you were doing some mooting as well. Uh, maybe you can touch on that as well. Yeah. So Ottawa was actually a really great place. I found some really lovely humans that I became friends with. I found Law school was a lot easier when you had a sort of a tribe with you um, to help you through things because you can't do everything on your own. Um, I also taught actually skating pretty much full time during law school. So I especially relied on sort of my friends and colleagues to sort of, you know, get us all sort of together through. Um, mooting was a huge part of it. In my second year, I got into the Vismoot team, which is a commercial arbitration moot that happens the finals in Austria. Um, in Vienna. So that was quite the experience that was very similar to skating in that we prepped for months and months and months for these submissions, you know, and yes, it was an imaginary case, but to us, it was very real. And it really honed our skills with making sure that every word we wrote in that submission was supposed to be there. There was no fat. We just, we cut that thing as lean as possible. And we actually won a couple of awards for our submissions, which were really good to get that nice feedback but again it was very similar to skating and we traveled to Vienna we were there for the week we had our job to do you know it was a really good experience I would say um it also taught me a lot about the kind of a lawyer that I want to be with respect to how to treat a team so you work as a team like in skating we have an individual sort of sport, right? But actually you work with your coaches, you work with your athletes that are work, uh, training together with you. You work with your physiotherapist, you work with your psychologist, like there is a team behind it. So the moot sort of showed me that in law, it's very similar. You do have to count on your team. Um, so for us, it's assistants, legal clerks, you know, like we as an office work all together. If I have a question about corporate law, I'll go over to the corporate department and ask because I don't do that. (laughs) Right. I have a family law client right now who's um, they had a bunch of businesses and they had bought property and all this stuff together. So we're now um, having to do a lot of corporate law to untangle them. Right. So that kind of thing is, again, it's a team based environment. So I really, I really learned that you have to sort of take care of each other too, through both being in Ottawa, but also doing the moot. People think, And act sometimes like they're sort of an individual and that's, you know, the glory is all for them. And, you know, that kind of a law student or lawyer exists out there. But I think from what I've seen, the successful, successful ones are ones who can relate to each other as a team and take care of each other. Um, Yeah, I learned that in skating and I saw that in the University of Ottawa and with the moot. I do I'm teaching a legal research and writing com- uh, class, uh, not competition class. Uh, and certainly from that competition there, you mentioned uh, winning some awards. Any tips there in terms of legal writing? I mean, I think uh, certainly, uh, you know, it presents its own challenges when you're switching from you know, just general writing or even essay writing from, from other programs. Is there anything that you know, really helped you get through law school in terms of you know, whether it was a memo or whether it was a case brief? Uh, what did you find uh, brought you your success? So I think um, we had a dedicated first point first writing academy in in University of Ottawa. And I find I thought it was a bit gimmicky at first because I was like point first, like whatever, (laughs) because I didn't know any better. Um, But taking that writing class, honestly, was mandatory. But I think that was one of the more useful classes I took in law school. I did not realize when I first got into law school how much writing I was going to be able to have to do. Um, I thought it was mostly like in the movies where you just go and talk to a judge and they give you what you want and you're happy in a nice suit. (laughs) So that's not what it is at all. It's you're mostly writing and I spend my days just typing away, you know? So I think the writing class I took was very, very, very important. I had never thought that deeply about words and editing and revision and how many times like you had to read and you had to revise your work to make it 
just so. And now I cherish that because as I write like a legal opinion for a municipality that has hired us, I want to make sure because that's going to be there forever. I want to make sure every word I wrote needs to be there. It's not fat, it's trimmed and it's as accessible to the lay person as possible because the council that read it generally council as in like municipal councils or city councils, not lawyer councils, they don't know the law. They're just people that are elected. Right. So you really have to make sure that what you write is accessible. So there was a lot of Latin use of Latin in law school. Lots of people just peppered their essays or peppered their briefs or memos with Latin and that you sound cool, I guess, but no one understands what you're saying. And it's just, that's not the point. The point is to be able to be easily understood or not misunderstood. Um, what I find now is when I write factums, um, I make sure that I'm friendly to the judge's eye in that I have enough space between things. I don't, if I have one case, that's amazing. I'll use that case. I don't need seven cases for the same point. Just once they can see it, they get it. It's a nice recent case or it's the seminal case on law. And that's it. Like, don't pepper, don't put everything you have in there. The judge is a human. You know, they have things to do. They have kids, they have families. They don't want to be reading your factum for seven hours and they won't. And at the end of the day, now you're doing a disservice to your client because you've just a build them for however much long it took you to write that, you know, and two, now the judge has not read your work. So you're going in front of this judge who has just given up on your advocacy skills, basically. So point first, lay terms as friendly visually as possible. Those are my three top goals that I even like to, cause I'm not perfect. And I sometimes have to rush things and they don't look as good as I'd like to, but you know, I definitely give myself like two, three revisions at the end of something, reprint it, read it again, because I inevitably always find a typo. Even though we have the squiggly lines in word, what I find most with my typos is when I write judgment, I use judge with an E instead of J and then M E N T. And that's my, that's my big. So I do a control F for that. Just make sure I find that in case. So I have a list of things that I like control F just because that those are my common mistakes. So you can definitely put that on the side on a post-it note on your computer and right before you're about to submit something, just control F the whole document for those kind of little whoopsies. So those are like a couple of tips that I, I use myself again, not perfect, but you know, we're all a working work in progress. Yeah, those are great. I mean, I think uh, if you, especially if you can use those functions there and, and spot those and often it's because, you know, you know, you may look at the same thing and you're looking at it because I always make that same thing. I might miss it uh, and give yourself a reminder there uh, to do the, the searches I was switching from written advocacy to oral advocacy there again, whether you want to draw on, on the mooting experience or your practice there in litigation, any, anything you can share from you know, the evolution from student doing mooting to practitioner now, uh, what's worked for you from then to now, or you know, what have you had to change in terms of that experience? And, and uh, how do you get uh, psyched up now for you know, court to, versus you know, from you know, a, um, a European championship or the Olympics or the world championships? So preparation is key. Obviously, you want to go over your argument. Um, The great news about having Zoom court right now is that you can have all the papers around you. You can even have another laptop screen in front of you and you can actually read your oral um, oral argument. Not that I suggest that, but I've seen a lot of people do that. And I'm like, that's not the worst thing to do, just because, again, you're trying to serve your client as best as you can. And if you're comfortable with speaking to the judge just as is go ahead. But if you aren't, you know, if you're not there, that's okay. Just slow enough and speak slow enough or read slow enough that the judge can take their notes. Because um, the one thing that's unfortunate about Zoom is that you can't see the judge's hands. So it's hard to time with yourself. So you have to keep one eye on the judge. And if you're reading another eye on the, on your, what you're reading. Um, but as far as moots go, we, I mean, as a student, I thought it was a ton of work. It was very stressful, (laughs) but I realized that was one case over like eight months. (laughs) Now I have like 800 clients and 500 open files. And like every day it's something new and people are calling me on the phone and it's just like, you kind of deal with it as it comes. But I missed the luxury of just having that one case about chocolates. (laughs) It was, it was about cocoa. So yeah, um, 
definitely the learning curve after school was huge. Um, we didn't learn anything procedural as far as like, let's say family law, like we never learned how to write a financial statement that's huge in family law, right? So when couples are separating, they're going to figure out their, their finances and who gets what and how to do a equalization payments. We didn't learn that in law school. And I don't know if it's because I didn't really take an advanced family law class, but I did take a second year family law class. So that was a huge change for me from law school is the practical nature of it. Like we'd never actually drafted any of these things. So I hope your students get a chance to draft some things, um, in class. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a quite a change, but you know what, again, teamwork, um, the firm being supportive, the firm being, having really amazing assistants and clerks that help you, that teach you through it and being humble enough that you can go and ask for help because we're just starting out. Like we're not supposed to know everything and we can't possibly. So after you've exhausted your Google abilities, ask somebody because you just wasted two hours of your time when you could have just asked you know, and then be thankful that they're giving you this, these gems is that's the other thing is that, you know, you have to be grateful for people sharing their, their wisdom with you, their knowledge with you. That's, that's huge. So I think those are some of the things that we sort of have to do as, as newbies in the world, in the world of law. So yeah, let's talk a little bit more about that transition then in terms of you know, when you were a student uh, and then going through and, and summering and, and articling and now being called, think uh, and all at the same place so what uh, changed each time uh, and you, you had mentioned before obviously you know you had you know from that mooting experience you had an idea of what you wanted to do in practice um, how did you kind of go about I know last week I think was like the whole OCI process there for some students and you know again there's a lot of you know, a lot of anxiety surrounding that and you know and relief perhaps when it's over but what can you share kind of in, in terms of going through that experience of uh, you know, law school in there and looking for you know what what you're going to do after is you know, in, in terms of your articles and beyond. It's so hard to advise people for that particular thing because it's so different for everybody, right? Law school really points you towards the big law, Bay Street. That's the end that be all of everything in law school, just because I think the funding that they honestly get from Bay Street. Um, they always say there's alternative careers in law, but like there's one seminar on it maybe in three years. <laughs> So I think what worked for me was I was a bit more mature. I was a mature student. I went to law school when I was 30. So it helped that I had a bit more, I think, self-confidence and just knowing of who I, who I was and what I wanted. I had done my competing. <laughs> I was done that. I was more into cooperative and quality of life <laughs> as opposed to like cutthroat sharkness, which you think that I did a move. That's pretty sharky. And that it can be, it just depends on how you set up your environment. I think it all depends on who you are as a person and what you sort of allow around you. So, I mean, I didn't do OCIs because I knew that that's not something I was interested in. I wanted to sort of live at home and work a decent amount of hours and learn and practice law and help people. But I didn't want to be doing work at 12 o'clock at night for no reason just on the whim of a partner who decided you're going to have work on Friday afternoon till God knows what time, you know, and I'm not saying all big laws like that, but I hear things. <laughs> so for me, it was more follow what you want to do. Um, I didn't, I had a specific idea in that I wanted to do litigation because of the mood and because of just performing. I love that part. I just, I want to be in front of somebody and I want to talk and I want to, you know, share whatever I'm sharing. Um, which is why I agreed to do this with you. <laughs> but um, um, that was for me. And so whether it was employment law, whether it was civil litigation, that was kind of unclear. Um, but in the firm, I was able to do a bit of corporate law at first during my articles. And then I went back to the litigation department and I was like, this is kind of where I want to be. I don't really, I don't like real estate law that much. I don't like corporate law, but I did like small, I did small claims court things, obviously. And as I was articling, I did LTB as I was articling and I liked it. So I was fortunate enough to be hired back and get to do the same thing and just a bit more now superior court because I'm able to, a um, little bit of POA, still continue with the LTB, um, small claims, slowly getting back after 
after COVID, we're having settlement conferences again. So that's kind of nice. I have a trial scheduled in January for small claims. So that's good. We're, we're getting back to it, you know, because a lot of um, settlement conferences happened, but I had trials that were scheduled that were just not happening during COVID. So it's nice to just be back in it. But yeah, I don't know about advice to the general population. I think we just have to sort of see what we want and what we're willing to put up with and what kind of a life do I want at the end of this? Like, it's okay to be maybe 25, 24 and in the rat race, sort of, so to speak, like in the Bay Street type, like that's what I want to do. But I was 33 when I graduated law school. So I was not, not really interested in that type of life. I wanted to be home at a certain amount of time. I wanted to go to the gym at night. I wanted to cook dinner, you know, just that kind of healthy lifestyle is what I, I always took care of my body when I trained. So I thought that that was really important. I continue that through my career in, in law. So again, to each their own, do your thing. If you're not happy, you can change it. Right. It's not ever too late. Like I went to law school and when I was 30, like people are like, Oh, I don't know if I should go to law school. I'm 25. I'm like, well, you know, 25 is young, 30 is young, do it, do what you want to do. No one's stopping you. Great words there. I mean, I think uh, a lot of times you get caught in, like you said, the rat race, or you, you come to school the first day and you see whatever big Bay Street law firm plastered on somewhere, and you think, well, this is where I'm going. But uh, no, it's great to, you know, to share that. And again, I think for, for anyone, uh, whether you know, law students or my paralegal students or anyone listening about, you know, whatever you, it is that you want, I mean, don't kind of, as you said there, don't let that, uh, um, I'll be sidetracked because, you know, you think other people are, are going in this direction there. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about practicing in, in Aurelia there. And you know, it's quite a different experience. As, as you said, you're, you're probably able to go, go to the gym, take care of, of dinner, everything. Uh, what uh, is unique about that practice versus, you know, anything um, in terms of, uh, you know, a boutique type of firm? And, and um, as you mentioned, you can obviously have a little bit of everything that comes in the door. Yeah. So, because we're a small firm, we sort of take in, as I said, what we can. Um, so a bit of a jack of all trades, sort of master of none situation. I mean, that's not great, but um, you do master things. Eventually, there are things that come in the door that are quite often similar. But I do like the challenge of getting an intake from um, my clerk and they say, OK, you're going to talk about employment law with this person. This is their problem. So I will look that up <laughs> immediately, familiarize myself with whatever it is. And then speak to that client for about 20 minutes and just say, hey, I think I can help you with this or I think I know. But other times I've become comfortable with saying, I don't know the answer. Let me look that up for you and I'll get back to you tomorrow. And I think that's kind of key. You have to know your shortcomings and you have to admit them. And that's OK. You don't you don't have to have the answer to everything. I think when I first began law school, I thought lawyers know all the answers they do not. <laughs> I can tell you that when I, I was surprised when I started articling that this 40 plus year lawyer was asking me to do research memo on X, right? Um, don't you know everything by now? You've been here 40 years. What's up? But no, like things change. You have to do your due diligence and recheck and recheck and reread whatever sections of law that you're trying to rely on to advise your client. But I do, I think telling people, you know what, like this is my thoughts on this, but let me check and get back to you. That's huge for me. Um, when I practice a wide range of things, which is what I end up doing. Whereas if you're in a boutique firm, you become super accustomed to that one area of law, that particular area that you love to do. And you are an expert at it and you do it like with your eyes closed, which also comes with its dangers, right? You have to check <laughs> when you think, you know, everything, sometimes you miss a few things. So Again, the due diligence part is huge for me, especially because I'm new. And I hope that I like grow more um, mature and experienced as a lawyer that I keep that up because it's, it's, it's key. Um, assumptions are dangerous in, in my world. You know, you know um, things change. Legislation gets updated. You know, there's the gray parts in that. You're like, oh, is that in yet? Is that, has that been proclaimed? What's going on? Is it in effect? So I do a lot of that legal research. Uh, class, making sure I know if things have been, um, you know, proclaimed, <laughs> check through the Gazette. It's, it's not fun. A lot of the times that part isn't fun. It's not the sexy part of telling people what you should do, but it's very much necessary. 
I always I, I, you know, I smile here because you know when I was talking to students last week, our last class was about the gazettes and you know updating the uh, legislation, and I'm like, look, see, there's a practical example. I just don't make this up off the top of my head here, um, because obviously, if it's proclaimed versus you know when it goes into force, I mean, the whole case is different, right? When someone comes to, or if they came to you for something that happened a year, a year and a half ago, uh, and you're looking at the law today, I mean, it may not necessarily apply. Um, now, we talked a bit about COVID and, and how, you know, small claims court in particular, there's kind of waking up from its you know, hibernation, let's call it. Uh, what else in terms of the practice of law? I mean, I mean, I think your entirety there has been uh, with uh, with COVID, um, you know, changing things. What have you liked? What have you wish you got a chance to do uh, differently? Um, and you know, in all the different areas that you're practicing, whether landlord, landlord tenant board, POA small claims or you know, any Ontario Superior Court matters. Yeah, so I was fortunate that my second year summer and a little bit of my articling was before COVID. So I was able to shadow a couple of lawyers in Motions Court in Barry or LTB. I did actually a couple of LTB things myself and then um, a little bit of family law, but not a lot. And then COVID happened, so everything was shut down. Um, the courts, like Superior Court, picked it up pretty fast. Like they were on it, which it was pretty cool. Small Claims Court, as you mentioned, had less resources. So things ground to a bit of a halt there for a long time. Um, The thing that I miss about going to court and sitting in the lawyer's lounge is listening to the breath of wisdom that surrounds you with all these lawyers that just, they catch up with each other. They ask each other, like, what do you think I should do for this? I've got this craziness here. And like, just that banter back and forth, that like aura of learning, um, we don't get that unfortunately. So that part has been definitely a miss. What has been amazing though, is I've been able to be in Bracebridge court and Newmarket court in Barry court all in the same day from my office within hours of each other, which is great because I don't have to charge my clients to drive there, to sit in motions court for the entire day, just to be heard for five minutes at the end of the day. You know what I mean? So it's really good for access to justice and that, you know, People have bills that are slightly more affordable than they used to be. Um, the bad thing about that is that people don't settle as much when they're not faced with a $30,000 bill. <laughs> you know, when it's $2,000, they're like, oh, I can get this going. I can fight over that tea, ca- tea kettle. Like, really? I'll buy you a tea kettle. Let's just get over it. But yeah, so there's, those are the positives and the negatives that I've seen. Um, again, the camaraderie is kind of missing. I didn't know a ton of lawyers. I'm sure lawyers who have known each other for years kind of miss that more, the camaraderie, the friendship, the catch-ups, but um, I'm just sort of salty that I missed out on all the learning, <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's not like they can send you to a breakout room to, to just talk shop there with the, the other counsel while you're waiting. Yeah, um, get your own breakout room and you're like, just wait. What, what about, I mean, just being on Zoom there and, and advocating, do you, is it any different than when you would do things like the moot or anything in person, or is it, is it the same thing? I mean, I think that's the question I get for students when we do these mock hearings, mock trials in class, you know, what do I do differently because it's on a computer versus if I was in the court? I mean, is it also part of the, the aura, right? I mean, it's like, if, you know, you, you've obviously competed, uh, you know, is it different being at the Olympics versus being at, you know, a small uh, I'm well, not going to say small, but, you know, a smaller competition where, you know, like a skate Canada, well, skate Canada is pretty big, but uh, you know what I mean? Uh, uh, yeah. In terms of uh, the atmosphere. Yeah. yeah, well, for sure. You, that pomp and circumstance really gets your butterflies going and that's good if you can get them all to fly in the same direction, you know, but if your butterflies are just going in all kinds of directions and you have have that insecurity, then it can affect you where you, you know, aren't maybe performing as best as you can but again it only comes with experience like no one gets to the supreme court without going through all the levels right so you don't get thrown into the olympics without doing the skate canadas and the worlds and all of that so i think for me i've been lucky that zoom has been around at the start so at least they can't see my hands shaking i can just put them down (laughs) so one of the things we learned in the moot was when you're on the, the the podium And it's very like Bill Clinton or like a president kind of thing. You hold on to that podium on the sides like this, like just hold on. If you're one of those people that fidget or that do something that distracts the judge with your hands or play with your hair, which we tend to do. Um, So 
that is kind of eliminated in Zoom court because you're just up here, you can't see. Um, so that's a positive of Zoom court. Um, but I mentioned earlier in Zoom court, you sort of don't see what the judge is writing or when they're done. And that's a bit of an issue as an advocate. You want to make sure that they get down everything that you want to say that is important. So you have, you'll have three points and you'll say under this act, this is how it should be. My client did this and this is why it's contrary to this, whatever. But you want to you wanna watch their eyes to make sure that they're listening to you and they're actually writing this stuff down. And then they look up to you and then you keep going. So that's a bit of a, a miss in Zoom, depending on where the judge's camera is. Usually it's kind of awkward and it's up here. So you, you really can't see their hands. Um, but judges have handled it quite well, I think. Uh, case lines has been very helpful because for a while we weren't sure what judges got as far as submissions. Um, so I would always, right before a court appearance, email the registrar everything again just to make sure that it was available for that judge that day might have been overkill but it was a lot of times they needed it so case lines has been good for that at least they can access it and you can sort of see what your opposing counsel has also loaded up there and it's because sometimes they don't serve you which isn't good yeah because it used to be you had to file at the court like in person and if you were late the court wouldn't let you file right? So that was great. So now opposing counsel tend to just throw them up there and they don't serve you or care or count days, which is kind of important. So um, that kind of thing has been good for access, at least for prior, prior to a trial. Yeah. I was surprised too when that happened. <laughs> what do you mean? You've missed your deadline. You were not by the rules supposed to be able to do this, but you've just thrown it up on case lines. Okay, let's just go. <laughs> yeah, I guess I mean in terms of obviously electronically a, a little bit more leeway is afforded and you know, some people you, know, you give a give an inch take a mile uh so to speak there but uh um is there any difference I guess I mean I, I have paralegal students who do you know landlord tenant board are interested in that in in small claims in POA as you mentioned some areas that you're practicing in as well as obviously the civil matters that go to superior court do you come to landlord tenant? Is it any differently? I mean, is there is there a way to be caught off guard because of the process being different? Maybe you can share from you know, the different avenues of, of court or tribunals that you've had experience with. And uh, you know, is there a deer in a headlights moment because you you switch from one to another and you're like, oh, I, but this is how they do it in small claims. Um, have you had those experiences? For sure, for sure. It's a little bit of an adjustment each time, especially landlord and tenant can be so different depending on which member you have. It's just, and it's just such a, a mess <laughs> sometimes because mostly it's self reps, right? And a lot of times people talk over each other, especially on Zoom. I find Zoom is really bad for that for landlord and tenant. Like you can't like get people to just, you know, speak on their turn. They just speak over the other person. And that's frustrating for the person listening, like the member. So I've had multiple times where members have had to mute parties, which is, you know, bad decorum you know, in that state. So that's been hard with landlord and tenant. Um, also landlord and tenant board is a little bit different in that uh, members sort of run their own show more so than the court. So it's very much which member you get. So it's a little bit nerve wracking because you're not sure how things will go. You adjust, they tell you, but sometimes I need something like an uh, agent, like a representative, um, uh, declaration saying that I represent this client. Sometimes I don't need it. Like it's just, it's just very different um, with what the member decides to do that day. So you adjust, but um, it's definitely, I think a little bit harder on zoom actually than, than in real life. And they also schedule like 400 hearings a day and they only get through 20. So that's a, that's an issue. I'm not sure who does the scheduling, but it's not the best. Is, is it faster or slower? I mean, obviously, you know, the, I remember when I was traveling to the places up north and then going back to Toronto, uh, most of the day was in the car. But other than, I mean, obviously that benefit, I mean, is the actual process going any quicker or are you still um, kind uh, of having like, oh, you know, you're on mute, make sure you unmute type of things? Or, or is it no, that's always that's always the case. It's I think I think it takes a little bit longer, honestly, right now, just because the whole talking over each other, or at least that's been my experience. Um, 
where I've had high conflict landlord and tenant issues. Um, and they just talk over each other and you can't get them to be quiet and listen. Uh, so it's taken longer in that way. It's harder to yell across a room at somebody in, you know, in the landlord tenant hearing room than on zoom, you can just talk. <laughs> so people have been muted many times. It's, it's been bizarre. <laughs> what about now? I mean, small claims court in terms of you said you you had these settlement conferences and now you're progressing towards trial. Um, how have you found you know, in terms of doing settlement conferences uh, virtually versus you know, going into the, the very courthouse there and, and having it uh, wait your turn there and have the matter addressed? I like the zoom settlement conference. Actually, it's a lie. It's not zoom. It's on the phone. So the small claims ones are, I've been on the phone thus far. Um, and it's good. Um, it, I don't find it much different than, than just going, except that you're not going and wasting time traveling or waiting around. Usually I'll have another file I'm doing some work on. And then, you know, when I get the phone call and they say, okay, we're going to do this, I'm on it. So you're, you're not having to dock it like four hours for this $10,000 thing. Like it's really making it more accessible to people. I think the zoom slash phone, uh, for, for conferences that in that way, I haven't, again, I haven't had a small claims trial yet. I'm going to in January in zoom. Um, but I don't know. I don't think it'll be that bad. Honestly, I I'm looking forward to it. I think it'll be better than actually going to the courthouse courthouse is, um, for small claims things and just kind of a hallway like you're just in the hallway with all the people and it's just it's a bit of a mess it's loud you can't talk to your client you don't find a place to talk to your client you know a quiet place where you can say okay here's what we should do what do you think are you okay with this deal like there's none of that whereas a zoom breakout room or just on the phone um you can just talk privately to your client and explain to them you know i think you should take this or i think we should do this so it's a little bit better the one cautionary thing I have though, I had a elderly client who, um, so we were on the phone, all of us on small claims for a settlement conference. And I asked the, I asked the court and I said, can I have 15 minutes with my client? Because I'd like to talk to her so I can see if she'd like to settle or, and they were sure let's just put the phone down. You call your client. So I called my client on her daughter's cell phone. But when she's talking to me on the cell phone, I can hear her from the main line. So the other side can listen into our private conversation. So I was like, hey, can we step out of the room? Because she, like she didn't know that she was in the same room as the actual phone call to the court. So so we stepped out of the room or she stepped out of the room. So I was able to call and because she didn't have a mute button on her phone because it's an older landline phone. Anyway. So that's just a fun moment where I realized this is not the most private conversation we're having right now. They can hear us. So let's just take this somewhere else. So that's a bit weird things that you never had to look out for that now you do. Yeah. And certainly any other technological challenges, no internet connections, all of that uh, can, can go awry. Right. So um, same things to, to make note of as, as much as there is access, further access to justice, you have to make sure there's access to justice for everyone uh, who may be in, in different locations. Uh, do you find, I mean, in terms of your practice, in terms of the firm's practice now, uh, because you, you can do things remotely, um, I know you had mentioned actually that you were pretty much coming in as, as normal into the office, but uh, does that open up areas beyond you know, Aurelia Berry kind of up north there? Have you seen any other clients coming in from you know, Ottawa or, or Toronto or anything like that? Or, or does that uh, change kind of uh, the the model there for a small time? Uh, I mean, you're also probably seeing the opposite. There are a lot of Toronto lawyers and are saying, hey, you know, we can take that Aurelia matter now. Uh, We're a little bit drive up there. <laughs> <laughs> We're a little bit more affordable for sure. But no, I've had um, a couple of Toronto clients as well as Ottawa um, and everywhere in between actually lately, because I say, cause they call and I say, Hey, we can do this. It's on zoom. And they go, okay. And I think, I think we are a little bit more affordable than, than downtown Toronto. So it's kind of a plus for us. Um, you know, we can probably provide a little bit more of a personal service than maybe they would get down there. Um, but again, I can't speak to, to people's experience, but I have seen in the short time that I've been practicing that now I have, you know, Newmarket, Bracebridge, Toronto, Ottawa, Renfrew, like, so kind of all these places that I don't, I didn't think I would be doing work for. Um, and it's been 
easy. It hasn't been, it hasn't been that bad. The fact that we can sign things on, you know, zoom with people execute documents. That's amazing. Um, yeah, I wish we could sort of do like a PDF signature that wasn't manipulatable so that we could take that next step. But I think we've done a great job with sort of the 2020, 2021 coming into the century of law, as opposed to being back where we had to fax things. <laughs> I remember trying to fax things when I first started and like listening to the beep. Did it go? Did it go? Did it not go? Is it sending? Like it was just such a pain. <laughs> it's funny because uh, I mean, I think until earlier this year, that was still an acceptable service. Uh, or maybe it still is, but not the, you know, the, you, know, you can send an email to the other parties there or the crown you know, for, for criminal matter and it would be okay. Um, now, one of the things I've talked you know, quite a bit with uh, all the different people on is, you know, in terms of taking care of you know, your mental health and, and making sure that, you know, the practice of law, obviously, there's a lot of stress uh, uh, and certainly something that you can relate to from even before law, right, in terms of gearing up for competitions. What uh, what do you do now? I mean, I know you're still got your, I guess your skate uh, dipped into the rink there still, uh, so to speak, uh, with uh, figure skating. But uh, what do you do? I mean, again, you, you mentioned the the reason, one of the reasons they're being uh, doing what you're doing is you do get that that time to yourself. So how do you take advantage? How do you de-stress from you know a difficult uh, case or a matter that went you know in the, in the landlord tenant board? Uh, what do you do to sort of take care of your mental health? Yeah, that's a a great question. Just because I think it's really important that we don't burn out. Um, I don't know everything, and then there's and there's always I have this file of things I want to read that just ev- is ever growing. I should know this, or I should read this and I should catch up on this. And, um, but at the end of the day, it's like, we work really hard all day long. And when I get home, I, it's so easy to sit on that couch and just veg for four or five hours straight. I could just sit there. I could just go on reading Reddit and just watching Netflix and just wasting my life, which, you know what, there's days where I do that and that's okay. Right. But I find a structured sort of committed, stable gym routine, (laughs) whether you go and you're just on, you know, you can still watch your Netflix, but you're on the cross trainer. At least you're doing something right. Or whatever it is that you like to do. If you like to go for a walk, um, in the summers, I try to play tennis with my husband, um, a couple of times a week, just because it's different and it's outdoors. Whereas, um, in the winter, as you know, in Canada, it's not really possible to do much outdoor regularly. So definitely going to the gym, um, as much as possible. Again, I don't make it every day. Um, and that's okay. You have to give yourself permission to have your days where you're going to be lazy. That's okay. Or you're going to do laundry instead. You know, you have things at the house you have to do to go grocery shopping. That's okay. Those are things you have to take care of, um, to be able to not have to buy McDonald's the next day at lunch, because now you have leftovers. These kinds of things are really important. Um, I make sure to pack a lunch every day, every day I pack a lunch. I have leftovers from dinner just because, not only do I actually get to, I work through lunch while I'm like eating whatever stir fry I made the night before, but, um, it's healthier, right? It's just a good habit to pack all kinds of snacks and lunch. And I, myself and another lawyer are the only ones that really do that at work. Um, and I think it's so important. Like I usually have a morning snack, some type of fruit, my lunch, some type of other fruit, and then like an afternoon snack. (laughs) Um, food is a, a thing where I, I take comfort from food too, which is also why I have to go to the gym <laughs> because it balances itself out. Um, I love eating and I know that about myself. So I make sure that I hit the gym and they equal themselves out. But again, the thing about food though, is it's fuel. It fuels your brain. So you need those sugars to pump through your blood, through your brain. So you can actually think throughout the day. I, I don't understand how and lots of people do this, just one coffee, and then they just go all day or two coffees and they go all day. I just coming from the athletic background that just like blows my mind. I go like your body is an engine and you're fueling it with some type of syrup. Like it's not good. <laughs> have your coffee, but like have a snack, you know, have some fruit, some peppers, some cut up some cucumbers, have some carrots. I know that sounds maybe lame, but honestly, that's like chowing down on that while I'm typing. It's just the best. <laughs> So yeah, mental health, physical health, those are all sort of connected. And I don't think you can disconnect them in any way. I think one has to be there for the other to work. Um, So yeah, having a plan to 
regularly hit the gym or take a walk. Um, I, I take walks. Um, I try to, uh, at lunch at work in the summers that I find is huge. Um, yeah. So if you can walk, if you can go to the gym, if you can just get some type of exercise and eat healthy, I think that does a, goes a long way to mental and physical health. Uh, it's really stressful in law. I found that there are days where I wake up at 3am and, and just can't sleep because I'm thinking of whatever I'm thinking of. And, um, it's just, you get those days, but then you can counteract that with physical and mental health sort of, I guess, plans. Um, not that they go according to plan every time, but if you have a plan and it's consistently executed, so your trend is always the same, you're going to have these days, but if the trend is the same, then you should be, you should be all right. In my opinion. Now, I know you also, and thanks for that. Um, for, for sharing all that. I know everyone's obviously different in terms of what, what they looked towards. Uh, I know you also did some work in, in legal aid clinics uh, uh, in your past. So maybe you can talk a little bit about that experience um, uh, and, and what you gained from that and why it's important, again, with respect to access to justice. Yes. So in my second year of law school, I did an internship at uh, the legal aid clinic in Aurelia. And I learned so much about yeah, like how privileged we actually are to be able to be where we are. Um, I think it's really difficult to navigate the legal system when you haven't gone to university and we haven't had the chance to be able to, you know, have a moment to look at the laws and read them. Um, you know, we have a lot of people that need help and that need access to justice that's affordable and a lot of people can't. And it's like these legal clinics do such good work, but there aren't enough of them. We always, I remember client people calling in and just we couldn't get to you in the next six months. So it was a lot of LTB things too. Like they would call because their landlord is doing this. And it's like, sorry, we only have capacity to serve this many clients and you're this many plus one today. So we can't help you. Like that's a really hard thing to do. Um, I had to learn to sort of be okay with that for a little bit, just because what else are you going to do? You're trying to serve everyone. There's not enough resources to go around, unfortunately. So um, yeah, it's really hard. So I volunteer at a women's shelter. Um, I'm on the board of a women's shelter in Aurelia. I think that that kind of work is difficult because you already work so much and so long and coming home and doing board meetings and this and that. And it seems like it's a lot, but actually our communities need us. They need us to do this work. Um, people don't love lawyers. <laughs> so it's also nice to connect with people in the city that think that, Oh, you're a human being. You actually care. You're not just some, you know, Harvey Specter or whatever. That's like in a nice hot suit and like, you know, so I think it's really, really important that we can give back and volunteer as much as we can again, while keeping yourself healthy. Um, but yeah, that legal clinic experience was, it was tough in a way because it was hard to know that we can't help everybody. That was, that was hard. Um, I just thought, you know, as a youngin, <laughs> I thought, you know, they, people get help when they call, just call the legal clinic, they'll help you, but it's, it's difficult. There's only so many resources to go around. So it shaped me in that I realized like this community needs more. Um, so being part of a small community in that way is I can sort of try to make an impact at least in a small way. I found throughout my skating the you know, the Turkish community, Canadian community supported my skating. Um, I had a lot of friends and people helped me out throughout my life. And if I can give a little bit back, you know, cause why, why else did I go to law school for? Why did I spend three years learning all this stuff if I can't help people? Um, yes, I want to sustain my own life and I want to be able to pay my bills, but at the same time, like, there are so many people out there that could use an hour of my time, you know, would be so much better than not giving that. So, um, yeah, I think legal clinics do amazing work and we just need more resources for them. So whoever's voting for whoever, you know, in the next election, think of those kinds of things. These are important. Um, nobody wants to spend money on that type of thing. And in, in during election time, because it's not a hot, sexy topic, like let's help legal clinics, but like, how else will we help these people otherwise? 
thanks so much uh, Tuba there and, and thanks as well for, for giving us this hour here for talking to, to my students and anyone else that will be listening to this later on I think uh, you know it's a, a lot uh, of great information there uh, again probably the the best uh, or one of the best certainly origin stories there and, and such an interesting path to uh, where you are today and I think again as you were talking about uh, and one of the you know, the real goals here of why I you know, sort of accidentally came into doing this and having so many different guests was to, to show that there's so many different alternative paths uh, because exactly I had that same experience I was just actually talking to Osgood students where I went to uh, earlier today at one of the clubs there and, and I was saying well you know you get all this information about you know, this path but what about all the other people because there are far more lawyers practicing in, in these alternative paths than in the traditional path. So make sure, you know, you take all that advice and I'm really glad that you joined us here and, and dispensed uh, such valuable information. I was wondering if you can conclude here with any final words of wisdom there and, and you know, thank you so much again for, for taking the time and joining us. Thank you, JP. No, it's been my pleasure and um, far beat for me to be that wise um, at the stage of my career. I just, I just think that you have to be true to yourself and take care of yourself. Um, that's, those are some of the most important longevity related nuggets of wisdom I can have. It's, we all have work, we all have lives, please stay true and keep the boundaries from meshing too much into each other. Cause you're in it for the long haul. It's not a sprint. It's a marathon. So please stay healthy, take care of yourself, take care of your friends and your colleagues, um, treat each other with a bit of kindness. It's so easy to get adversarial and high conflict. It's so easy just to rise that, raise that temperature. Um, just, you know, the more measured you can be with an opposing counsel, the more you'll help your, your own client. So, yeah, I think those are it, but thank you again. for Perfect. Thank you again for joining. I wish you all the best. Uh, and, uh, as you continue to grow and, and again, as you were saying, you know, every time we learn some new, new aspects there. And I think, uh, you no, know, it's great that, that you were able to share with us and uh, wish you all the best. And then to all those who tuned in, thanks for joining us and hopefully tune in again tomorrow or anytime when you watch a replay, they're always available for you. So take advantage of all the education you can get. Thanks again. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone.